Hello. For tonight's grisly tale, I'm going to read you a story from more grisly tales for gruesome kids. These are cautionary tales that I wrote for lovers of Squeam. Tonight's story is called Knockdown Ginger. It was a well-to-do private road in the town of Nimby. Barriers across either end restricted access to residents only. Mercedes, Jaguars and Jeeps lined the leafy drives while children played safely in the front gardens. This was Millionaire's Row, where money talked and where keeping up with the Fortescue Smythes was what mattered, so that the oldest resident, poor old Mr Thrips, was despised for being different. His was the house with the boarded up windows and peeling paint, the overgrown garden and cracked drains, the earth sculptures and beehives. His was the sore thumb, the carbuncle, the blot on the landscape. His was the house with the fat, flesh-eating flies in the dustbin, the house with the dung beetle's dung pile on the porch, the house with the wasps in the windows, the ants in the plants and the ticks in the bricks. His was the house they called Bug City Central. Ginger Pie was a large, ungainly boy with pale, podgy cheeks and light red hair. He was so fair that at a glance you could be forgiven for thinking he was bald. He lived opposite Mr Thrips, and just for the fun of it, he and his best mate Milo, a wild child with baggy trousers, devoted their spare time to wrecking the old man's life. It's what bullies do, persecute people who are different. They called him names, they yelled, Bug man, bug man, squirt him with a spray can, while spraying his house with a particularly potent insect repellent called a slow lingering death. They hung big notices on his front door that screamed, Bug off! They released his rare collection of dragonflies by smashing a window. They sprayed his flowers black to confuse the bees. And they filled an umbrella with snails, pushed it through his letterbox, shouted, Snail mail! And sprang the umbrella open so that the snails splattered in a slimy heap on his doormat. But why? lisped Milo's little sister Eliza, who couldn't see what harm the old man was doing. Because, snorted Ginger, he not only does weird things, but he looks weird too. So do you, said Eliza honestly. You're so pale, you look like Dracula just drank your blood. Oh, shut up, Lizzie, barked Milo, or I'll tell Ginger what your nickname is. No, don't, she cried. Her tongue was too long for her mouth and flicked in and out of her lips. You know I'm not a lizard. Oh, blooming blast, I've said it now. I'm not Lizzie the Lizard. I'm not. And she started crying because she told Ginger what it was by mistake. He's a freak, Ginger continued cruelly. His back's all bent over like a beetle's. His eyes pop out like a fly's and his head's all covered with thin bits of hair like a hornet's leg fur. Then, just to prove his detestation of Mr Thrips, he ran across the road, scrambled up the rickety fence and shouted, INSECT MANIAC! to the old boy's back while he was tending one of his soil sculptures. That's not nice, said Mr Thrips without turning round. Not nice at all, Ginger. The boy froze. How had he known it was him? Well, he's probably got eyes in the back of his head, said Milo when Ginger told him. Oh, you know what that means, Ginger gasped. Never stick your tongue out when his back's turned, suggested Lizzie. He's not a man, he's an insect in disguise, like a scorpion fly or something. The children's mouths fell open. What a totally terrifying thought, living next door to a two metre tall scorpion fly. He has to go, Ginger said coldly. There's no room for human flies in Nimby. 
At that very moment, Ginger's mother, Mrs Amelia Pye, was reaching the same conclusion at a meeting of the local residence committee. She was chairman. Well, he has to go, she shrieked from her position of power on the stage. His house is a disgrace. It's filthy. He breeds insects in Tupperware bowls. Mrs Deacon raised her hand. That reminds me, she said sweetly, there's a Tupperware party round at my house next Tuesday evening, all welcome. Thank you, Kitty, said Mrs Pye politely. Much obliged. Then, in the blink of an eye, she was spitting venom again. I mean, his soil sculptors are a disgrace. They're five metres high. They hum like some gypsy's generator. They look like something unpleasant that a very large dog has left behind. And they block out my son when I'm sunbathing. Uh, if I might interrupt, interrupted Colonel Dithering, knowing a little of the Australian culture as I do, being a cricket and boxing kangaroo enthusiast, I... They should point out that those structures are not, in fact, soil sculptures. The meeting gasped, as chairman of the residence committee, Mrs. Pye, was never wrong. They're, they're termite mounds. Mounds of termite? She sneered, laughing at the absurdity of it. I thought termite came in jars. <clears throat> that's, that's marmite off the colonel. Termites are little white ants that eat houses. Eat houses. Now, here was an issue the committee could really get into a flap about. Crisis, crisis, shrieked the treasurer, causing an instant uproar. If the termites eat our houses, who will buy them, said one. Where will we park our cars, said another. Who will come to our cocktail parties, twittered a third. Well, the solution is obvious said Mrs. Pye decisively. We must get rid of Mr. Thripps and flatten his house to the ground. But where will we find someone to undertake such a disagreeable task? fussed Mrs. Deacon. Well, I know just the person, smiled Mrs. Pye. Well, he'll have to be cruel, vicious and nasty, said the Colonel. Oh, he's, he's definitely that, smiled the Chairman. He's a chip off the old block. Yes, but, but who is it? My son, she said. Ginger. All hysterical nonsense, of course. If anyone had bothered to ask, they'd have discovered that far from being a flea-ridden weirdo, Mr Thripps was a respected entomologist who studied insects for a living. Nonetheless, Mrs. Pye talked to Ginger, and Ginger talked to Milo, and between them they came up with a devilish plan to run Mr. Thripps and his termites out of town. They would play Knock Down Ginger. Now, for those of you unfamiliar with Knock Down Ginger, it is a puerile game played by puerile children with brains the size of tadpoles. That said, it can be quite fun if your victim is the pits, but Mr. Thripps was not the pits. He was the bee's knees, and that makes all the difference. Basically, knock-down ginger involves ringing a doorbell and running away like a lily-liver coward before the door is answered. The first time Ginger and Milo did it, it worked a treat. They crept up on the house, commando style, and hid behind a bush while straws were drawn to decide whose finger should do the honours first. Ginger drew short. He took a deep breath, narrowed his piggy eyes, dashed up the drive, stabbed the bell, and sprinted back to the bush as fast as he possibly could. He needn't have bothered. Mr. Thripps was so old and infirm that it took him the best part of ten minutes to open the door. The boys marked his slow progress from the back of the house to the front by the sound of his tiny, frail voice. Coming! It whistled. Don't go! I'm here! Coming! When at last he opened the door, his chest was wheezing. He was panting like a three-legged horse in the derby. Hello? His voice trembled weakly. Is anybody there? After taking a slow, painful look around, he shut the door and went back inside. 
Ginger and Milo sniggered like jackals. They gave him ten minutes to return to his armchair before Milo took his turn to ring the bell. Another ten minutes passed before a grey-faced Mr Thrips pulled open the door and slumped against the frame. Hello! He could barely speak, he was so out of breath. I'm sorry it takes so long to open the door, but it's my aching bones. Hello! Oh, for a pair of wings! And with that, he shut the door. And with that... Ginger ran forward and rang the bell again, and so on, and so on, and so on, all afternoon, until Mr Thrips was so exhausted that he could no longer walk. By the twelfth ring he was opening the door on his knees, by the thirty-third he was crawling, and by the ninety-seventh he was dragging himself on his belly. Yes! came the feeble cry. Who keeps ringing my, my bell? What do you want? But there was no reply, just the faraway sound of two poisonous toads croaking. Or was that giggling? Mr Thrips could not be sure. Oh, oh, I've had an idea, said Ginger excitedly. You keep doing the knock-down Ginger bit at the front while I go round the back and knock down his termite mounds. OK, grinned Milo. Why? Because termites eat houses, squealed Ginger, who thought his brain was bound to burst from having so many brilliant ideas. And when they eat Thrips's house, he'll have to move. He darted out from behind the bush, vaulted over the garden fence and landed right in the middle of the mounds. There were five, all dusty brown and grouped in a loose circle like stone hens. Ginger hadn't expected them to be quite so big. They were three times his height and towered over him like giant chocolate raisins. He put out his hand and touched the baked mud. It was vibrating. He pressed his ear against the dry crust. Deep down there was a faint humming noise, a stomping and crunching like distant soldiers marching, like an army of steel-booted ants on the move. A door latch clicked inside the house and Ginger span round. Milo must have forgotten to ring the bell. Mr Thrips was in the kitchen. Now was not the time to termite. With two giant steps, the fearless prankster was at the foot of the fence. One leap and he was over. A short run and he was back at the front door. A quick press and the doorbell was ringing for the umpteenth time. Only this time, Ginger did not run away. The old codger was in the kitchen at the other end of the house. He'd just seen him. He had at least ten minutes. Ginger put his ear to the door and gave Milo a cocky thumbs up. But just as he did so, the door was ripped open and he was plucked off the step by a claw. Yes, said Mr Thrips. They stood facing each other in the hall. Ginger was wondering how the old man had reached the front door so quickly. What do you want? Ginger was looking for the claw, but none was in evidence. I presume it's you who's been ringing my bell all afternoon? The boy's mouth had seized up. He had just noticed that the walls, the floors and the ceilings were crawling with insects. Crunchy ones, buzzy ones, stingy ones, leggy ones, diggy ones, snappy ones, sucky ones, nippy ones and pretty ones with wings. I said repeated Mr Thrips, with a steely glint in his eye. What do you want? Ginger had a stag beetle on his shoulder and an earwig in his ear. Um, he was finding it hard to concentrate. Then I'll tell you what I want, hissed the old man. I want you to leave me alone. Ginger Pie, I want you not to ring my doorbell any more. I want you to buzz off and leave me 
in peace. The insects buzzed loudly to reinforce what their master had said. The walls throbbed as they hovered on the wing and Ginger's top lip began to sweat. He thought he would go home after all. He didn't mind the crickets in his pockets or the ladybirds in his hair or even the wood lice in his nose. It was the cockroaches in his socks that he objected to. But as he was turning to go, he heard a faint humming noise coming from the other side of a closed door. It was the same noise he'd heard in the termite mound. Don't even think it, said Mr. Thrips. Think what? said a startled ginger. There's nothing but danger there. Mr. Thrips was spooking ginger with his wide staring eyes and crooked neck. Where? What are you talking about? Leave now while you still can. What is behind that door? I knew you wanted to know really, cackled the old man stepping forward. Oh, all right, you've twisted my withered arm. I'll show you. No, blurted Ginger, I've changed my mind. I don't want to see it. But Mr Thrips had already opened the door and was beckoning Ginger through with a lopsided smile as creepy as a crocodile's. Standing in the centre of the empty room surrounded by a misty halo of dust was a white wooden chair. It was vibrating so fast that to the naked eye it didn't appear to be vibrating at all, rather like a dentist's drill. My termites are allowed out once a day for exercise, chuckled Mr Thrips, coughing on his own spit. Where are they? asked the boy. Can't you hear them? Well, I can hear tiddly munching, Ginger said, but I can't see a thing. You have to look with your imagination, Mr Thrips explained. Allow your mind to wander inside that chair. No, it couldn't be. It was incredible. Well, it can't be inside the chair. Why ever not? Because how did they get in? From below, said Mr Thrips. Didn't you know the termites eat from the inside out? Just then, a small piece of wood, no bigger than a coconut flake, was pushed out of one of the legs. The humming suddenly grew louder, and a procession of white bloodless ants poured through the hole like skydivers tumbling through the open door of a plane. The termites opened their translucent wings, streamed through the window, and flew in single file back to their mounds in the garden. Is that it? asked Ginger. Have they eaten the chair? Every last morsel, replied the entomologist. But how can they have done it still standing? Watch, said Mr Thrips and he raised his right forefinger and brushed it lightly across the back of the chair. It instantly collapsed into a pile of sawdust. From the stunned look on Ginger's face, Mr Thrips could see that the boy was impressed. They work from within, he explained, and never touch the surface. They can eat an entire house and leave the outside looking completely untouched. So much so that nobody knows they've been there. Ginger didn't believe him. It must be a trick, he said. No trick, said the old man as he showed the boy to the door. Just the magical forces of nature. Now do me a favour. No more knockdown, Ginger, please. Or I might have to play a few games of my own. Ginger found a nervous Milo sitting on the pavement with Lizzie. Oh, thank heavens, he cried. You've been gone hours. I, I thought you were dead. Oh, he was weird, trembled Ginger. Those termites are his pets. Milo said that I could try and knock down Ginger, lisped Lizzie excitedly. He said it was fun. No, said Ginger. No more. It's not safe. Why? 
Milo asked. Well, because they're not natural. They're like insects from another planet or something. They eat things inside out and they don't have blood. Lizzie started to cry. Can I change my mind? She sobbed. I don't want to be naughty any more. Oh, shut up, barked Milo. You're both a pair of scaredy cats. Ginger flinched. Yes, I am, bawled Lizzie, and I don't care who knows it. I'm going back for another ring, Milo said. Ginger was having a crisis. Milo was taking over and he didn't like it. The termites had been freaky, but Milo telling Ginger what to do felt wrong. Besides, what had seemed spooky in the old man's house now seemed rather silly in the cold light of day. How could Ginger Pie be scared of a few flying ants? Out of my way, he snapped, pushing Milo and his sister to one side. Let the knockdown king through. And with that, he ran up to the house and rang the bell. Only this time, Mr. Thrips did not come to the door. In the back garden, however, there was a frenzied buzz of activity. The ground trembled and the termite mounds thrummed. Ginger waited for Mr. Thrips for half an hour, ringing again and again and again until eventually it wasn't much fun anymore and he turned around and went home. He felt rather deflated. Knocked down Ginger was rubbish if the victim didn't come to the door. He put his hand in his pocket for his house keys, but he'd left them inside. He raised his finger and rang his own doorbell. Then he stood back and waited for his mother to open the door. Ringing the doorbell was his first mistake. The sound waves filtered down through the ground and guided them in. Standing still was his second. It offered a target. It turned him from standing ginger into sitting duck. Suddenly, the earth rumbled under ginger's feet. It sounded like a distant underground train or high-pressure water rushing through a pipe. It was racing across the road from Mr. Thrips's house. From below, two words, those two terrifying words kept repeating themselves inside Ginger's head. They entered from below. He looked down the path, but by then it was far too late. Now it was Mr. Thrips's turn to play knock down Ginger. It was quick and painless. The termites had had a lot of practice on chairs. Ginger felt an itching in his shoes, then a pricking in his heels, and a strange thickening sensation that crept up his legs and spread through his body as if his blood had turned to sawdust. The termites left through his ears and made a beeline for the house. Mrs. Pye opened the door to find her son standing on the path like a statue with a wide-eyed look of surprise on his face. Ginger, what are you staring at? Ginger? She touched his cold cheek and he disintegrated in front of her into a pile of ginger dust. She screamed and ran back into the house, slamming the door behind her, shuddering the foundations and juddering the walls. By the time she'd reached the telephone, her house had disintegrated too, and Mr. Thrips's termites were folding their wings and settling down in their mounds to sleep off their unusually large supper. <laughs> <laughs>